earlier this year, Ralph Brown, who is in charge of exhibits at the library, wanted to do an exhibit on famous designers or famous radios, and there may be not so famous designers. So they asked us if the club would care to supply some radios. Well, most of us have hundreds of radios, so that was a no-brainer. Uh, so we, we helped him put this exhibit together, and we uh, hope you enjoy it. Uh, it's an aspect of radio collecting that even uh, seasoned radio collectors don't know too much about. And so uh, it was an interesting uh, project for us as well. Radio really started uh, in 1900, but from 1900 to 1920, it was only in use by uh, the maritime services and the military. In 1920, radio broadcasting started, and a period of, of the 20s was really um, uh, a, a frantic one. Everybody was buying radios, and uh, in that short period of time, millions and millions of radios were sold. But they look like uh, this first radio is an early 20s radio, and the next one beside it is about a mid-20s. Uh, and they took a lot of messy batteries. It really weren't very pretty to look like look at, and you almost needed to be an engineer to operate them. Then in the, uh, in the 30s, uh, the situation changed drastically. Uh, the Depression came, and uh, you really had to work to sell a radio, and that's when the period of uh, bringing in industrial designers to design radios and uh, when radio started to really take on their own unique look. And uh, so to carry on with that subject, I'd like to present John Okolowitz from Ambler, Pennsylvania, who is a club member. He's written quite a few articles on radio design in radio periodicals. He has one book here, which he's written. And he's working on a new book uh, on the subject of radio designers. And uh, he's going to tell you all about it. Thanks, Ray. OK, I want to back up just a, a little bit to give myself a, a running start here. As, as Ray said, this is what radios looked like uh, in the 20s. And I don't know about you fellas out there, but uh, if you have wives like mine, there would be no way that these things would ever come into the house. And, and of course, in those days, they, they didn't. They were disguised. We put them in cabinets, and uh, the companies formed alliances with Pooley Furniture Company, uh, Keel Furniture Company, Red Lion Furniture Company. In fact, the Keel Company had a, um, a factory right below the uh, Ben Franklin Bridge, and I think the sign was there until just a few uh, years ago. But at any rate, uh, Keel would put them in a, a nice little coffee table, and it would look like a coffee table. You'd never even know that it was, a, it was a radio, so that way you could please the little woman and, and get it into the house. And of course, in the, in the 20s, because we were floating in money, I mean, it was the, uh, similar to the um, wealth effect that we had of a few years ago, uh, um, uh, the booming 20s. Uh, no one cared about industrial design, and that was no better characterized than um, with uh, Henry Ford, who said, you know, you can have the Model T uh, in any color as long as it's black. Now, that's customer satisfaction, right? So um, at any rate, uh, in parallel with what was going on in this country, in Europe, they didn't have it so good, of course. It was uh, the end of the uh, uh, World War I, and uh, they were pretty much decimated. So I guess the people over there had more time to think um, about their situation. And there were some schools of thought uh, taking place that uh, were, were trying to find ways to integrate the new uh, gizmos that were uh, coming about, uh, how to manufacture them uh, uh, better, and um, things like uh, the uh, ornamentation. The, uh, when you put this in a table full of uh, uh, lion's heads and claws and grapes and uh, you know, women's hair and whatever, all that uh, exotic carving, uh, is that really the best way to, uh, to make a buck? 
and, and use machinery. Well, it isn't. It's very expensive. And uh, even taking one of these sets, um, we have a uh, cathedral set out there, the, the round cathedral set. And it takes a lot of uh, manpower to uh, form the wood and put 10 coats of paint on it, wait for it to dry, uh, things of that nature is very expensive. So one school in, the, uh, in Germany called the Bauhaus uh, movement um, formed in about uh, 1925. They um, espoused the theory of uh, less is more. In other words, just uh, make the, the shape or the form or the object do what it's supposed to do and, and nothing more. Uh, in parallel with that, in, in France, uh, there was a uh, exhibition in 1925. Uh, it's um, commonly referred to as the Art Deco Exhibition. The name is, you know, a typical French name, about a mile long, and I can't pronounce it, so I stick with the Art, uh, Art Deco show. Um, the, uh, the kind of designs that they had there were radically different than what we had in this country. Uh, typically a stepped form, kind of a skyscraper-ish look uh, effect. There are some radios out there in the uh, repro area that, that have that form. Uh, another uh, characteristic of Art Deco would be uh, the use of chrome or uh, black, black and chrome or stripes, curved uh, uh, use of curves. But in any event, all of these things were to optimize the use of technology at that time to make the product simpler uh, and, and accomplish what it's supposed to uh, uh, accomplish what it's supposed to do uh, without excessive uh, uh, amount of workmanship or, uh, as I said, ornamentation. Well, obviously come the uh, Depression, now all of a sudden manufacturers had a, uh, a new concern. How do, you, how do you get these products in people's homes when they don't have uh, much money to spend? Uh, we talked today about the um, consumer uh, helping us out of the, uh, uh, our present situation. Well, I don't know how you do that then when you had uh, one-fourth of the workforce unemployed. You have no social uh, uh, safety nets. You have uh, nothing like that. So they really had a, a, a task at hand that uh, we, can, we can only um, uh, dream about uh, and hope it never happens again. So um, to, uh, <clears throat> to solve the situation, we have something, uh, we have the uh, uh, industrial designer. Now, the industrial designer, uh, there was no such profession, uh, so it was quite an accidental thing. Most of these people uh, came, uh, were uh, interior designers, uh, or theater designers, uh, magazine illustrators. Uh, they worked on um, uh, decorating windows like a Macy's window or a, a Saks Fifth Avenue window, things like that, window design. So it was purely accidental that they would uh, work on, on that and at the same time say, well, gee, you know, I can make a product uh, much better than the manufacturer, and the uh, connection was made. One of the first um, uh, designers to... Uh, to call himself a designer was uh, Norman Bel Geddes, and he's referred to as the uh, P.T. Barnum of design. He, um, because he promoted himself in, in, uh, uh, at every opportunity. In fact, his name wasn't Bel Geddes. Uh, his name, last name was Geddes. The reason uh, he called himself Norman Bel Geddes is because he and his wife worked on a um, newsletter, and it was um, uh, Norma uh, Bell, that was her name, Geddes, and um, <clears throat> a combination of her name and his name. Well, when they divorced, he kept the uh, uh, tail end of that Bell Geddes because it sounded classier. And, uh, of course, that was his style. You want to promote yourself. And he, um, he got himself a... Uh, uh, an interview with uh, Fortune magazine in 1930 um, 
right about the time when he was starting. He really didn't have much of a career. He didn't uh, have much of a name, but he managed to finagle a, um, uh, an interview with Fortune and uh, promoted the idea of industrial design. And he's a designer, and he's done this, that, and another thing. And that put him on the map. It also uh, <clears throat> introduced the world to the, um, to the idea of industrial design. Uh, between the um, 1929 and 1939, that's uh, typ typically called the, um, <clears throat> the uh, decade of design uh, because of um, all of the um, uh, many things that were taking place. You had the Empire State Building, you had the Rockefeller Plaza, uh, you know, Chrysler Building, Chrysler Airflow Automobile, you had the, uh, uh, the Beetle, uh, Volkswagen Beetle Automobile Design, things like that. <clears throat> so you had all of these, um, even though it was a depression and you had um, uh, very little income, uh, at the same time you had many, many uh, uh, achievements taking place like that. As I said, Bel Geddes was uh, one of the first uh, designers. Uh, another one, of course, that we um, um, know uh, very well is uh, Raymond Lowy, and we have a picture there. Um, one of the reasons we know Lowy so well, and, and not too many people are aware of it, is that he had a, a personal PR person from almost the very beginning and getting him on uh, magazines like the Time magazine, uh, you know, the cover of Time, and uh, basically in, in front of people uh, from the very beginning. Um, and that, of course, uh, was important to his, his, uh, his success and the promotion of the whole uh, concept of uh, industrial design. There were some uh, other uh, designers that were just as uh, uh, famous as uh, uh, Lowy and uh, Bel Geddes. Uh, Walter uh, Dorwin uh, Teague would be another one. And between Teague and Bel Geddes, they had a rivalry uh, between each other to determine who really was the very first designer. Um, each one had, uh, you know, one claimed he had, he had the first industrial design office. The other claimed he had the, uh, he was the first uh, designer. <clears throat> Teague um, designed many uh, famous radios, uh, the uh, chrome radio that you see in the uh, exhibit, which is very striking and obviously very Art uh, Deco-ish because of the uh, uh, chrome uh, architecture on that. Uh, another um, designer is uh, uh, Henry Dreyfus. Uh, he's not uh, represented in any of the radios that we have here, but he was very um, influential in the uh, development of industrial design and um, the concept of ergonomics, of how to design something so that people can use it, sitting down at a uh, desk, uh, computer, cockpit, automobile, uh, whatever. There's a uh, nice selection of uh, books out there on industrial design, but uh, this is called uh, the 20th Century Limited. And it has a picture of the um, train, which is the 20th Century Limited. And that was uh, Dreyfus's uh, design, also used on a uh, uh, postage stamp, which is um, the, the postage stamp that came out recently that uh, highlighted the um, uh, stamps of the century. The, what I would call the big five uh, designers of the time, which would be Teague, uh, Van Doren, Dreyfus, Desky, 
uh, and uh, the El Geddes, they formed the um, industrial design organization. As I said, there was no such thing as industrial design before. They came along and they formed the organization. They also promoted the uh, program uh, so that it would be taught as a, as a discipline in uh, colleges. Uh, Syracuse University would be uh, one example of a um, university that's uh, very big in uh, industrial design. And they have a lot of the um, uh, repositories of, of uh, the designers' works, uh, designers who are no, uh, no longer with us. Uh, during this time of uh, the so-called decade of design, 29 to 39, um, there were also um, uh, changes taking place in the manufacturing process to uh, reduce costs. One of them would be the invention of uh, uh, plastics, things like Bakelite. Now, Bakelite had the advantage, of course, that you could pour, pour it into a mold and just keep cranking out these things. You wouldn't have to sit and paint these things uh, uh, five times and wait for it to dry or form the wood and all that uh, good stuff. Um, and between the Durez Plastic Company and the uh, Bakelite Plastic Company, they would put in full page ads in magazines uh, highlighting uh, their designers, such as Lowe or Teague or Dreyfus, things like that, to show the public how uh, progressive they were with these things. Prior to the industrial designer coming on the scene, here again with the invention of plastic, uh, companies still didn't know how to handle uh, or how to use the material because the first inclination was to just take a wood cabinet, make a mold of a wood cabinet, and do that in plastic. Well, that's not the best way to, uh, to come up with a shape. You want to design a shape that uses the material uh, to its uh, best advantage. Uh, one of some of the other plastics that uh, that came out at that time were uh, Catalan, uh, Beetle, Plascon, things like that, which were very, um, which were very colorful, and they contributed to the sale of the radios because of the color, but they're very hard to uh, to work with. Uh, for one, when, it, when you took it out of the mold, it had to be polished, sanded, uh, almost as much work as if you uh, used uh, wood. So I would say that you know, those are plastics that uh, were not quite uh, ready for prime time, so to speak. But they made some very uh, dramatic looking radios uh, because of the coloration. Uh, one of the most striking examples uh, of that uh, era was a Catalan radio that was designed by <coughs> uh, Bel Geddes, and it was called the Patriot Radio, uh, made by the Emerson Company. It was called the Patriot Radio because it came out in red, white, and blue. Uh, in one set, it was a white body with um, blue and red knobs. Another set would be red body with uh, the other two colors and, and so forth. So you had uh, the three variations, all based on red, white, and blue. Uh, in terms of uh, representation of what they did for radio companies in particular, um, uh, Bel Geddes uh, did designs for uh, Philco. We don't have any of those designs uh, here. Mostly uh, the, the only ones that I know of that he did were, were two big um, uh, console sets, but they were pretty dramatic and kind of had an art deco -y, uh, feel to them. Uh, Lowy did the, um, or his firm, uh, did the uh, Hallicrafter sets that you see out there. But the one thing uh, in trying to match designers with radios is very difficult to do, for one, at no place are you going to see uh, any documentation that so-and-so did this set. And even in the case of Raymond Lowy, 
the characteristic is that he's going to want to take credit for any design that his firm uh, did. So even though he personally didn't do the design, maybe one of his designers like Richard Latham, uh, in the case of the um, uh, Hallicrafter set, he still gets the credit. So you really can't, um, you can't be sure who, who did what. Um, and as I said, Dreyfus uh, did uh, a lot of um, interesting designs. He's one of the uh, most significant uh, designers of our time. Uh, with the 20th Century Limited, he designed the Princess Telephone. He did the uh, Polaroid uh, cameras uh, in the uh, 1960s. Uh, he did a little of everything. But he had an association with uh, RCA and uh, designed a few radios uh, for them. Uh, Dreyfus had a, a full uh, exhibit that was uh, put on by the uh, uh, Cooper Hewitt Museum in uh, New York City. The Cooper Hewitt Museum, if anybody is uh, familiar with that, that's on probably 95th Street and uh, Fifth Avenue. It, um, it is the d uh, design museum arm of the Smithsonian. So their emphasis uh, is just on uh, industrial design. And uh, from time to time, they have uh, special uh, exhibits focusing on a particular designer or a particular topic. Now, one of the, uh, one of the things that Raymond Lowy uh, stressed uh, about uh, design is he had a, a certain um, um, acronym. He called it MAYA, M-A-Y-A. And he emphasized that, uh, and that stood for most advanced yet acceptable. And an example of that it was the Philco Predicta TVs that you see out there, which were pretty dramatic uh, looking TVs. That thing really never sold. Uh, you couldn't even give them away. They were finally given to uh, motels in the 50s. And the reason is, I mean, they pushed, uh, they, they pushed the envelope. Those uh, Philco TVs were not designed by professional designers. They were designed by in-house uh, personnel. And that was pretty much characteristic of 99% of, 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 of radio design. They were always designed <coughs> by in-house people. Anytime you had somebody like uh, Bel Geddes or, or uh, Raymond Lowy or anybody else uh, involved, it was uh, on a short-term uh, assignment uh, basis. The um, uh, other things, a couple of generalities we can uh, make about the uh, design motifs uh, of the different companies. Uh, I would say uh, Philco and, and RCA pretty much made um, humdrum sets. And um, on the one set, uh, hand, that may sound bad, but on the other hand, here again with the Maya principle, they made sets that just kind of blended into the house, and those are the kind of things that people wind up buying, and that's why they sold uh, by the truckload. Uh, as long as you design things that uh, uh, feel like they should be there, they don't stand out, they don't uh, uh, offend anybody or, or uh, uh, stick out too much, those are the designs that generally, uh, generally sell. And if we look back on some of the radios out there, uh, the radios with the most striking designs are, for the most part, by some uh, oddball, uh, you know, not oddball, but by the companies that aren't number one or number two. Uh, you know, they're the, uh, uh, the Avises, so to speak, those that have to try harder, uh, Emerson and um, DeWalt and, uh, you know, smaller company names. Uh, by the time the 50s, uh, came on. Uh, the, I think the designs of the 50s would be uh, characterized by the word keech, which stands for, uh, you know, kind of a goofiness or campiness uh, type of design. It took the uh, Art Deco or modern theme and kind of stretched it uh, a little bit. And uh, to that end, uh, Philco 
uh, made some uh, made their wildest sets during uh, the tail end of the uh, 50s and 60s. They had one set that was uh, in 1949. It was called a uh, uh, at least by radio collectors a boomerang set because it had kind of a boomerangy looking uh, uh, shape to it. It's not a very common set. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's one of those sets, if you see it once, you know it. The, another uh, uh, set that's out uh, in the uh, glass exhibit area is a uh, Belmont uh, plastic set. That particular set is, is reproed today. They, they use the shell and uh, put in a modern uh, radio with a cassette and so forth. So it's in a way, a kind of a timeless example of, uh, of a uh, uh, 1930s, uh, actually that was probably at the end of the, uh, around 1940 design. Another uh, example of goofiness of the 50s would be the, the Sylvania TV with the halo light. It had a, um, a fluorescent uh, light around there and they tried to promote that as uh, being uh, good for the eyes when in fact it wound up giving everybody a headache that ever watched it, so. <laughs> Um, here again, you know, you, when, you, when you're desperate for sales, you, you try, for, uh, try for anything. And, uh, you know, just to wrap up, uh, as I said, it's very hard to uh, uh, trace the designs of some of these things. There, are, there is something called a design patent. Uh, if you design, uh, well, let's say a new radio shape, you can apply for a patent for it for a very uh, lim small amount of money and that gives you the right to, uh, to that particular shape. But a design patent has so little um, uh, ability to protect you because all you have to do is just change one little uh, line uh, in, in that thing or one, one little shape uh, could be very small or, or microscopic and, uh, and it's a different shape. So it's really not worth anything uh, for the most part. So. Uh, there aren't that many design patents taken out, but whenever someone does take it out, of course, it uh, allows you to uh, historically go back and uh, trace who the, uh, who the designer of an object was. But again, for the most part, it's, it's, not, a, uh, uh, it's not something that's easy to, uh, to uh, attribute the designer to, except in the case of somebody like Raymond Lowy, who um, uh, has a PR agent who publishes his own books uh, uh, trying to promote the things that he did, um, as did some of the other uh, big guys, Teague and uh, uh, Bel Geddes and so forth. And I guess that's, that's about it. <laughs>